Today I'd like to tell you a story, a wonderful story, a story about how a man came to become the Buddha. Every religion has its stories of its prophets and its teachers, and all have been singularly powerful and determined beings. The story of their spiritual lives have inspired many people to follow them, to follow these superior enlightened beings. Buddhists call this energy Dhamma. Uh, we could have just as easily called it God because this is just nomenclature. These are just conventions. These are the words of man and not of spirit. Now each religion has its treasury of stories and Buddhism is, is certainly no exception. It has a rich tradition of tales and fables and allegories all associated with the life of Prince Siddhartha the man who is later to become known as the Buddha, the awakened one. The story of Prince Siddhartha is one of the most intriguing, the most stimulating, and, and to me, one of the most alluring tales found in the world of the mysterious and the enchanted. And yet, it's grounded very much in the present day world, in our present day experience. While some parts of it may feel as if it may come out of uh, Arabian Nights or Grimm's fairy tales, and there, there's certainly elements of romance and intrigue and plenty of mystery. But it also guides us to a nature world which we don't see quite so easily, which may lie behind the concrete and plastic and TV screens which so obscure our vision and so distort the way we see the world. The story I will attempt to retell today relates to the last events which occurred before Siddhartha left the palaces of his father. They were events which led him to understand that he would have to leave the life of the palace, go beyond the life of the palace, enter into nature, and somehow to explore what was inside of himself on his own. But before he came to this fateful decision, situations and circumstances would have had to occur which would drop him down from this worldview that he had before, tumbling down into, into the world of humans out of this heaven realm which he, he lived in when he was a, the son of, of, a, of a famous and a, and a very wealthy king. The effect of these events on the mind of Siddhartha created such a bewilderment and such a sense of disappointment as well as anxiety and perhaps most of all a ferocious sense of desperation. They couldn't any longer endure the life of the palace. He had to move on. His spiritual life needed to move forward. Let's take a moment to look into the life of the prince in the palaces. I'm sure it's a lifestyle many people would envy, at least at first glance. It's a lifestyle that's not all that dissimilar to the kind of lifestyle that we lead here in the, in the doorway to the 21st century. Many people live a very privileged mode of existence. Um, everything they need is pretty much at their fingertips. And we can see how the prince, while he, there was a time when he could appreciate and enjoy this kind of thing, that he would come to a point where he no longer could tolerate it. He no longer could accept it. He had outgrown it. And when Siddhartha awakened from, from this, this world of the palace to a larger, to a fuller world, he realized that there was more to life. There was something bigger. There was something greater that he had to go find. Life offered more. He couldn't kind of just go along like a blind man with blinders on his eyes because these blinders had slipped off. And one wouldn't expect the blind man who was once uh, dependent on a cane and a seeing eye dog to, after his eyes were, were restored to full vision, to depend again on a cane and a seeing eye dog. Oh, life would become greater, right? Life would become more full. And so, the same with Siddhartha. He wanted something larger than the pleasure realms which, which he enjoyed as a child or as a teenager. You see, we could say he was uh, encapsulated in a, in a sort of a heaven realm, in a, in a deva realm, we'd say, in, in uh, the Buddhist way of talking, where all his desires and all his pleasures were, were instantly gratified. In his palaces, there were musicians. There were dancing girls. There was, I'm sure, 24-hour room service and games of all sorts. 
I'm sure he didn't lack the fact that he didn't have any video games or didn't know any about any video games because the, the accounts uh, record the fact that he may have had up to 40,000 servants who were available to fulfill all his fantasies, dancing girls, masseuses, probably a few cheerleaders as well. Each day would have begun in a very pleasant way. The minstrels waiting outside the door, playing soft music, luring the prince out of his sleep. None of those clanging alarms that jar us at uh, three in the morning, or even eight in the morning. There just would be this lovely sound of music. And then perhaps the doors would open and the girls would float in and the uh, incense, smell of incense would begin to waft into the chambers. And, just the enchantment of, of everything, of the, of the palace life, this continual enchantment. And there would, have been, there would have been masseuses just following the dancing girls with bottles of oil ready just to massage the parts of the body that, that were needed to be, to, to be massaged according to the prince's will and whims. Probably simultaneously, there would have been people coming in to change the flowers, make sure that there wasn't a, a wilted rose anywhere. And maybe when the prince got up to bathe and to wash a bit, people would have come and scrubbed the floors, made everything new. So there was almost a total continuity of everything being just about the same. Now, so while he was in, the, in his toilet, uh, perhaps the chef would have come and prepared his having prepared his favorite breakfast and put it down on his bed or maybe on the place where he ate at a little table. I've often wondered whether there were even people who came to brush his teeth. I think that would be about the most exotic thing that happened, could happen. Sure, his teeth weren't like, like uh, uh, the one George Washington had, you know, with the little, little wooden ones where you had to kind of go like that. It's a much more delicate operation than the ones that are real that are inside the mouth. So the, the point of it all is, is that he had everything. He was a man who had nothing but the best. And all the, the young women and all the people who came to serve him, they're all in the prime of life. Probably sometime during the day, the security people would have checked everybody out to see if there were any signs of aging or uh, uh, color changes in the hair or something like that because if they noticed that there was even a slight wrinkle or maybe just a little bit of crow's feet around the eyes, well, they would have just had to go gone right off the shelf. They would have hit their expiration date. So this kind of draws a bit of a picture of how elaborate this pleasure realm was and how uh, extensive. Well, what we couldn't think of anything more pleasurable, could we? It was wall-to-wall -wall pleasantness. And there certainly wasn't anything in this environment that would stimulate or provoke any philosophical consideration whatsoever. This would have been the most complete and most comprehensive heaven-like realm that anyone could possibly think of. More than, a, than even a Garden of Eden. So this was the life of the prince in the palaces of his father. If we describe the situation Siddhartha was living in while he was, uh, say, encapsulated in this gilded cage of his father, we would say that he was sort of stuck or mired in materiality, in, in sensuality. These lower forces, these forces of sensuality, which, which keep people uh, only in, say, one or two spheres of life. Because he was so thoroughly immersed in this level, we could rightfully say that he was in a state of mental illness, that he was like intoxicated by sensuality and the sense grat continual sense gratification. You see, the senses were, were continually flooded uh, by different things which would continually impinge upon the senses. The sense doors were busy receiving pleasurable contacts continuously. There was almost a non-stop uh, impingement upon the sense bases which we all have. Now there are no pleasures which anyone couldn't think of at that time which weren't available to the prince and which weren't always uh, instantly and, and continuously available to him. All he had to do was make the request. In one moment there'd be the pleasurable sensation of say something to stimulate the tongue. That's food. 
and that would be followed by, say, the appearance of a pleasurable form dancing by, and this is something which would stimulate the eyes. That might be followed by a sensation arising from a massage, which is, of course, something that just feels good on the skin, and so on and so forth. It's like one pleasurable sensation uh, following another in, in a rapid fire sequence, one topping up the other, so that this state of being drunk on intoxication is always continually there. So that his normal state was a state of, of being kind of under the influence or a slave to sensuality. Ears, eyes, nose, tongue, body, and the mind. These six sense doors continually being, being flooded, being bombarded by the external uh, things that were happening outside and in the case of the mind and the, in the internal uh, world as well. Now, Siddhartha was a prince, so he was an ordinary human being, just like we are. This meant that, that he, had, he had a mind and he had a body. And even though this, the prince lived his life in this earth world, Essentially, he was like a heavenly being that arrived here from a different planet, some sort of uh, variation of an E.T. So one of, the, one of the main attributes which distinguishes heavenly beings, or these people who sort of aliens or people living in angelic realms from human beings, is that human beings are subject to difficulties. This is the way our world is. And we're subject to challenges. And, and people in, in uh, heaven realms don't have these, these challenges. They just live a kind of a flat, on a flat plateau of sensory pleasure the whole time. They don't have uh, things to, to compare. Their life is just one, one syndrome of, of uh, pleasure and of, of contentment of some sort. And this is, this is probably something that, that happens to all of us at some time or another. We all know what it's like to have one pleasure after another and an af after another. Siddhartha was living a sweet and a sensual life in the palace. He didn't have a clue, really, to what the human condition was all about. So before he could really come to the point where he could function as a human being to begin a real spiritual journey, some really radical changes would have to occur that would um, take him out of this trance-like state, this state of, uh, of a deva, the state of, a, of an angel, and tumble him down into our world, where the, real, where the real work has to occur. You see, some consequential and some critical things were missing from his life. Well, what could be missing from a life of luxury, from a life of convenience? Hmm. Well, here it would be appropriate, I think, to talk about one of the kind of, say, fundamental uh, principles of Eastern religion, one of the principles that is now, I think, seeped into the West so that many people, many of you probably have at least some basic understanding or have given some thought to this idea. It goes just like this. The world is round and it goes around and around and around. This is the way the world goes. It goes around and around. It's on a wheel. And we can say that anything that's on this wheel, anything that's birthed and taken birth on this wheel, has to, in order to function properly, be in balance. And this was a very fundamental truth that was known even before the time of the Buddha, and certainly 2,500 years ago in the era of the Buddha. So what was missing from Siddhartha's life? Well, in relation to the way he lived his life, I mean, he had everything. But the everything he had, you see, only went in one direction. It wasn't anywhere near in balance. There was a severe imbalance. And this imbalance interfered tremendously with the scope of his life. There wasn't the counterbalancing which makes for fullness, for wellness, for balance. Can you imagine what it would be like not to have to do anything you don't want? What would life be like not to have to do anything you don't want? Well, some of you would envy it. Some of you would think it was quite wonderful. But let's just take some contemporary examples. You know, if you look, sometimes in magazines you see photographs of, of multimillionaires, or maybe they're billionaires, enjoying their life in some fashionable city, Rome, 
Paris, London, New York, a bistro, a nightclub, a discotheque. It's late night, surrounded by his friends. Everybody's looking like they're having a good time, drinks and and uh, smiles on their faces, a little superior smiles. And we'd think, you know, that, wow, this, this is really, they've really got it made. They really made it. They've got it all. But then, a couple of years later, same people, same photograph, same sort of environment. And we look at them a little more carefully and we see they look like they've aged about 20 or 30 years. And they're looking, a, everything's looking a bit more tawdry. Uh, this thin smile of superiority seems to have evaporated as well. Perhaps many of you have done something that I've done and some of my friends have done. We decided we just needed to stay in bed and not do anything. Maybe after a series of exams in the university. You go to sleep, it's 9 or 10 at night, and you sleep like a log until maybe 8 or 9. Then 10 you wake up, look at the clock, and you think, well, I don't have anything to do. I'm just going to stay here, luxuriate, float around in this wonderful dream world. And so you hang in there. Maybe you pull the pillow over your head, go back to sleep. And you can kind of push yourself into sleep for a couple of, couple of three more hours. It gets to be one or two o'clock in the afternoon. You're starting to get a little bit restless. Force yourself to sleep for another hour and that's it. You've hit the end. Because we can indulge only so far in anything. You, know, you can only go so far in sensory indulgence until you hit a point where it turns around and bites you. If we jumped into a great big pond of pleasure, whatever your pleasure is, it would be quite a delight in the beginning. But eventually, at some point, it would just get to be very wearisome and we'd get quite bored with it. And finally, we get depressed and angry with it probably too. So these same conditions, which initially would charge us with, with delight and enthusiasm, uh, go on to turn around and, and, and bite us and, and make us feel quite miserable. For instance, supposing you had the opportunity to go to Disneyland, but you had to be there for a week. You know, like maybe the first day you could go on all the rides and walk around, enjoy yourself, have a good time. Everything was a delight. Everything you approach with enthusiasm. And the second day, maybe a little bit of that would rub off. By the third day, You've gone probably beyond neutral. You're not very happy with the situation at all. Getting restless, a little bit agitated, a little bit irritated. Fourth day and fifth day, well, if you were forced to be there into the sixth day, you'd probably be ready to strangle Snow White and beat up on the seven dwarfs. And these are the limitations of the world. And because of these inherent limitations, because of the inherent system of, say, weights and measures involved with with uh, this life, this life on planet Earth, we just can't go too far without having to experience the reactions and the repercussions. This is inherent in the situation. So we're obliged to find the middle ground, the middle point, the balance point, because that's where life grows and that's where happiness is. Now, quite obviously, Siddhartha's life in the palace was unbalanced. It was a life solely dedicated to pleasure-seeking, and such a life cannot sustain itself. Eventually, unpleasant and disturbing thoughts will eventually come and creep into the mind, so that even the most pleasant night on the town eventually stalls and becomes wearisome. A good example comes to my mind is uh, flying around, sailing around in one of these great big ironbirds that go around the world. You know, you're in the airport, you've got your ticket, you're at the boarding gate, you're waiting for the plane to, to be boarded. In a couple of moments, they call the plane and you get up with your ticket and you file down the ramp, go down the ramp, and there at the bottom of the ramp, at the entrance to the aircraft, the cabin crew, they're sitting there with a great big smile on their face and they're pointing people to their seats. If you fly on Thai Inter, they're there with a big elegant Y like that. And if you're a monk and you enter onto the aircraft and tie into, they give you a very deep Y, very elegant indeed. And take you to your seat and put your things in the overhead rack. And you sit down in the seat, put your seat belt on and settle in. 
few minutes later, the plane crawls out into the runway, starts taxiing to the end of the runway, and uh, you see, feel it dawdling along, and you look, and there's other planes moving along, and, and you see perhaps that the, you might be number three, and then there's number two, and number one, and the plane makes this turn, revs up its engine, and pff, begins to take off. 40, 42 seconds, 45 seconds later, in a remarkably short time, plane's airborne, and you're up in the air. Plane's flying along for a few minutes up in the air, looking for uh, its altitude, and you hear a little bing, and the cabin crew jumps into action. And next thing you know, there's this whole procession of things occurring. You get the hot towels, you get the cold towels, you get the snack food, you get magazines, newspapers, uh, stereo. Then you get the meal. After the meal, they put the video or the movie on. Maybe you get some writing paper. There's this whole procession of everything you could think of to make you feel good and to see to it all your desires were fulfilled one after another. So you always topped up, much like the life in the palace, isn't it? And your body at the same time is feeling very buoyant. So if you're a meditator, you're just sitting there in samadhi with your eyes closed, feeling the lightness of your body, really enjoying the trip. And of course, this will go on for four or five hours. Everything is perfect, except maybe there's probably not enough toilets. But the plane ride is, is quite as good as you could expect anything to be in this life. And about six hours later, you start to wonder, when am I going to get there? You look at your watch, and you're thinking about what you're going to do when you get there. And, and in about seven or eight hours, you just feel like, I'm just feeling restless. I just want to get back on the earth, back into the earth world, because everything is unbalanced up there. That's the heaven realm. And so, from our own experience, we should know that you can only go so far before you need to get things rebalanced. So let's, let's talk about balance for a moment because this is the key to happiness. It's absolutely essential. And because of the imbalance in the direction of pleasure, if we go too far, there's always going to be this nagging, if subtle, feeling of unsatisfactoriness. Life is unsatisfactory because something is missing. And it's not always the brain that really understands this because the brain can be made happy a lot easier than, say, the intuition, which knows something's quite wrong. I've got to get myself back into balance. I've got to get myself centered. Something isn't quite right. There's a fly in the ointment. There's a fly in the massage oil. So, stepping back and, and looking at this life of luxury situation, the way the prince lived, we can see that it isn't uh, the string of the, of of fulfilled desires that makes happiness, but rather its balance, its middleness, its harmony with all aspects of life. All sides of life have to be contemplated in order to be a solid, intelligent, sensitive, compassionate human being that is a whole human being. I'll just mention a few kinds of qualities which are ennobling. Intelligence, sensitivity, Compassion, kindness, spontaneity, nurturing, selflessness, like that. These high-minded qualities can arise in a world